Hi, I'm Bob from Insidium, makers of X Particles and Cycles 4D. And in this tutorial, we're going to be looking at taking the scene that we built last time out and rendering it in Cycles 4D. Here's how it looked in the X Particles reel. We'll be building our material from scratch and using some custom black and white noise textures to mix shaders together in a very interesting way. We're going to be using some of that colour data that we burnt into our cache to give us some interesting transitional effects. And then we'll finish up by using some depth of field and some motion blur. So, let's get started. So here's our cell auto coral growth scene that we built in the previous tutorial. If I hit play, we have got these particles floating upwards in a nice kind of turbulent organic motion. And then we have our coral growth uh, making its way up and we've got a pretty simple nice camera move in there so before we go on to rendering with cycles i'm just going to do a, a little bit of housekeeping here which will hopefully make our workflow more efficient so here are my two x particle systems one for the cell auto which is the the coral growth and this has been cached. The cache is red which means it's reading from a cache and both the open vdb mesher which is the mesh itself has been cached, and the particles which are driving that um, mesher have been cached as well. So that means I can scrub backwards and forwards. So let's just minimize that one. And if we open up the system EFX, which is um, controlling the movement of our floating particles, this hasn't been cached. And that means that every time we're running this through, um, Cinema 4D is having to process all of this exposure effects information to drive these particles. So what we're going to do is cache this system as well, so the computer's not having to waste resources doing that when, when it comes to rendering. Uh, but we don't actually have to cache the exposure effects simulation, which, if I make it visible, and just come out of this camera, it's this explosion which is driving these particles upwards and that is advecting those black and white particles. But we don't need to cache this information because we don't really need it. We, we just need it to move these particles and then we'll just cache the position and colour of those particles. So it'll be a much smaller cache file and it'll read and play much more quickly. So to do that, we'll go to other objects and we'll, in this pull down menu, we'll select a cache object and I'm going to tick only in same system, which means that it's only going to cache um, objects which it can cache within this EFX system. So it's not going to try and overwrite any of these ones that we've already cached. All right, so before we build that, I'm going to select internal memory, make sure that I've got compressed cache on build selected. And then I'm going to go to this inclusion tab because I'm going to uncheck include EFX because I don't want to cache this object. We don't need that data once we've recorded where the particles are moving to. So that's going to keep this uh, light. Okay, so that'll do. So if we go back to the object tab, we can now uh, build cache. And this is going to cache quite quickly because all it's doing is recording the positional and the color values of these floaty particles and it's not caching all that EFX information. So that's done. And now the, the emitter has a red cache tag. The cache object has turned red, which means it's reading from the cache. So now what I can do, I can switch off that exposure effects object. So it's no longer making any calculations. And now we have got a fully cached scene from the elements that we need cached. So that's going to work a lot better. The only other thing I'm going to do before we jump into uh, into Cycles 4D and start rendering is, um, if you remember, we have this camera move. Um, and as we play the scene, the camera is animating upwards and it's rotating on the heading. And all of those uh, keyframes are being dictated by this null object, this cam controller. The camera itself isn't animated, but because it's a child of this null, which is, it's moving with it. But if, if I dollied in with this camera active, it's going to mess up the position of it. So what we're going to do is add a Cinema 4D protection tag, which is just going to mean that we can't accidentally adjust this camera by mistake, and we'll, we'll have this move that we've pre-recorded uh, saved. So I'll just go to tags, Cinema 4D tags, and we're looking for the uh, protection tag. Uh, 
And now, even if I try and move that camera with the one, two and three shortcuts for, for dollying and orbiting, it won't work because of this protection. All right, and that means that our camera move is safe and we're not going to accidentally mess it up. Okay, so now we're ready to go into Cycles 4D and start rendering this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to change my layout uh, into a screen layout that is going to be better for demonstrating Cycles. So I'm just going go to uh, go to this saved layout here, uh, Cycles 4D, and I'll just explain exactly what we have here. So my object manager looks exactly the same. It's the same object manager. It's just been moved down to this corner. Uh, my viewport is very, very small. Let me just come out of that camera. I've got it docked here. So here's my viewport of the scene. If I press play, it's happening. But I don't need a huge viewport um, in this view because I'm more interested in the cycle's real-time preview. So I have that viewport so I can still navigate it, but it's made very small down here. And then the major part of the layout is I've got the cycle's real-time preview window here where we're going to see the renders. And I've got my material node editor here where we're going to build our materials. So at the moment, if I press play on the real-time preview, we have a black screen. And that's because there are no lights in this scene. So Cycles can't see any of these objects that we've put in. So the very first thing we're going to do is, is bring in a Cycles 4D environment, which is a little bit like a Cinema 4D uh, sky object. So let's go to Cycles 4D and we'll go to environment. When the environment has been put into our object manager, it has an environment texture tag attached to it. The texture tag has been created here. And if I click on it, we can see the nodes of how this texture tag has been set up. And in our real time preview, um, this environment object is now lighting our mesh and we can see it. Okay. So at the moment, the background, it, it's only, can, it's, the, the, the material is just one node. It's this background uh, shader. That's it. And it has two controls, a strength and a color. Now, there's one little tip here. Um, if you uh, want to change the color of this, you can double click on this box and then change the color. But it will only update once you hit OK. Press OK and then everything is blue in this environment. And that's fine, it works, but it's not very efficient. So a better way of adjusting the colour is if you have the node highlighted, its settings then appear in the normal attribute manager. And if we pull this colour down, we can now make live adjustments and those adjustments will update immediately. So it's a much more efficient way of, of, of picking colours effectively. Okay, good. So we're not actually going to use a colour from this palette. We're going to input a colour. Now I want this to look like a, a realistic sky, a bit like a physical sky in, in Cinema 4D rendering. So what we need to do is bring in another node which is going to feed in that information. So the way we do it is right click in here and we're going to go to uh, texture and there is a sky texture. So let's bring that in. Now in Cycles 4D, even if this node isn't attached to anything, if you click on the output, it gives you a preview of what that uh, node will look like in the viewport. So now you can see that this sky texture is brought in this kind of ground plane, and then we've got this sky in the background. And now this is lighting it, and our object looks very different. So I won't go through this massively, but basically turbidity is a bit like haze. So the more turbidity you have, it's kind of bringing in more kind of sun haze. The less turbidity, the sky will look bluer and it's kind of, a, you get a colder look. This brings in a warmer, um, a warmer flavor. Okay, so that looks all right. So what I'm gonna do is pipe that into my color input with the background node and now that's all hooked up and that's working. Now I want to use this background object to light the scene but I don't want to see it. This isn't going to be part of our final render. So what we need to do is, is disable its visibility. So if we go to our environment object in the object manager and go to its attributes, 
what we can do, we have this ray visibility. And this is like a compositing tag in Cinema 4D. So if I uncheck camera, the camera cannot see the background object, but it is still being used to light um, the mesh and light the scene. So there we go. So if I made, just made a few adjustments to this, you see the lighting is changing, but we're not seeing that background. Okay, so that'll do for now. I'm not going to get too hung up on the background. Right, so now what we need to do is we need to make our texture, our material for our coral. And it's a hugely complex look, uh, the final render for this. There are kind of black shiny parts. There are gold leaf parts. There are the glowing blue parts as the coral um, grows. There are bits of bump. There's displacement. There's all sorts going on. But all of that is achieved with one material. And that is the beauty of this procedural node-based material building. So what we need to do is, is start that material off. So I'm going to go, this is my material manager here. I'm going to go create cycles 4D. And I'm just going to make an object material, which brings in the material here. So let's put it onto our, I'll tell you what, let's just minimize the effect system. Let's open up the cell auto coral system and the mesh this 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 uh, material needs to go on the mesh which is the open vdb mesher so here's my object material drop it on as you normally would and it's now applied to our object so the object material in cycles brings in these two nodes so this is just the output node that comes with any uh, material um, and this is feeding whatever we put into the surface of our object so that's the output node and then the object node uses what's called the principled shader and this is a really clever shader because it can be used to make almost any material so if I have this metallic slider set to zero, this is a diffuse material and I can change the base color. Remember, make your color adjustments here. So let's give it a horrible color. So we can change the base color and if we increase the uh, roughness amount, then we're gonna make it a fully diffuse material with one and if we bring that down, the specular starts to have an effect and it can look shiny. So that's a diffuse material. It can be a glass material. If you put transmission onto one, it becomes a glass material. Now, obviously with glass, you wouldn't want any color in the base color. So then if we, if we had objects to reflect and to refract in our scene, you would see this and this would look like a transparent glass material. So it can do glass as well. Uh, it can do subsurface scattering looks. Um, using these so if you wanted a kind of a translucent material that absorbs light and spreads and scatters that light you know, like wax or uh, that kind of thing um, you can do subsurface scattering and also you can do metal if we turn the metal slider to 100% to 1 it now becomes a metal object and you can play with roughness and get different metal effects so it's hugely powerful and um, you can apply a top coat with a gloss you can color the gloss differently you can have uh, bump maps for the clear coat and a different bump map for the base material uh, and it's incredibly powerful it's a brilliant node but we're going to use it very basically we want a metal material so i'll leave the metal slider up on one and we want it to be pretty dark and i want a hint of blue in it so something a bit like that so now if i come in a little bit let's have a look okay so i think we could be maybe be a bit lighter a bit more blue all right and i think we could roughen it up a little bit and have it slightly less shiny okay that's good so this is our base material, and there's an awful lot of um, ports in here, and it's taking up a lot of real estate in our node editor, uh, and we don't need it now. We're finished with the adjustments on this one. So what I can do, if I right-click on it and put Hide Unused Sockets, it then becomes a much more manageable node. Brilliant. So that's our base coat. So just before I move on, if you can notice in our editor, we're getting these um, kind of blocky um, edges. And that's because our mesh in our object manager, it's, it's, it's not a very high poly mesh. We kept it low poly so it would, it would animate quickly. So let's fix that. 
without having to rebuild this mesh, making it more dense and then recache it. So what we'll do is we'll use a Cinema 4D subdivision surface to do that. So click on this button here, which brings in a subdivision surface to our scene. Let's drag it down into our generator submenu. And in the subdivision surface, by default, it's going to subdivide it two times in the preview window and three times on render, uh, which we, we don't need that much detail. So let's just stick that to one. And we'll put our open VDB mesher inside the subdivision surface. And you can see now that it's much more heavily subdivided and we've smoothed out those horrible edges. Uh, but it should still play relatively quickly in the viewport. It's still using the X-Particles cache, um, but now it's being smoothed out. It's not going to play as quickly because it's having to subdivide it and make those calculations, but we're still getting decent performance. Right, so this is our base texture now, and that's looking quite good. So what we want on the outside of this, we want to um, simulate a, a, a kind of a thin film reflection, those beautifully separated colours that you get on things like, you know, bubbles and whatnot. And there is a way of, uh, there's a fantastic shader, uh, which was created by a really talented user in the Cycles 4D community. And he built a group um, to make realistic thin film shader. And it's, you know, it's, it's, about 50 of these nodes to, to create it, and it's brilliant, hugely powerful. Um, but we're just going to cheat it for this, and we're going to cheat it for a couple of reasons. One, because it's it's a really good trick. It's very fast to render, because they're only going to use three nodes. And for this render, the subtleness of the th of the thin film effect, um, it, 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 this, this cheaty way is going to work. It doesn't need to be photoreal. So the way we're going to do that, we're going to mix our base texture, which is this one, together with a highly reflective material. So let's build that highly reflective material. We'll go to right click, shader, and we're going to bring in a glossy. So remember with cycles, if we want to see what just this one looks like, all we have to do is click the output node and there we get a preview. So it's a highly, highly shiny, glossy, metal-like surface okay that's good but we don't want it to be this color we want this glossy effect to have that thin film refracted kind of light look so the way we're going to achieve that is we're going to use a noise to color it so we'll bring in the noise so right click and we need to go to texture and we want to bring in a noise texture so again let's look at this so in cycles, um, the noise has both the factor, the black and white values, but also it has color data as well, which is very useful. So this is what we're going to use to color our um, to color our very glossy shader. So if I just pipe that into the color, and now look at this one. So now you see, for free, without doing anything, we're getting this suggestion of something that looks like that thin film bubble look. There's a couple of things we have to do to adjust this to make it right. Now, at the moment, Cycles doesn't know how to map this noise texture onto our object, and we need to tell it. Now, this is the object is an open VDB mesher. It doesn't have any UV coordinates, so we can't use UV coordinates to tell this noise where to be mapped onto the surface, so we have to do something different. Thankfully, it's very easy. I'm going to right-click, and we're going to go to an input node, and we want a texture coordinate. And the texture coordinate comes in here, and these um, will tell the texture how to be mapped. So if I select UV, it's not working. We don't have proper UV coordinates and so on this. And so this is this UV map is going to look dreadful if we try and map noise using this. It won't work. But what we can use is one of two. We can use generated, which are the coordinates generated by the object. Now, the generated um, are very good and they, they give a good approximation of how this texture will be mapped on. But sometimes if you use generated, it can stretch textures sometimes. Um, 
And we don't want our noise to be stretched, especially when this object is going through its growth period. If the textures start to stretch and move, it's going to shatter the illusion that it's part of that. So instead of using generated, which, which does a good job but can stretch and bend, we're going to use object, which is doing a very similar thing, but it's not stretching and bending it to fit. Um, so let's put that into the vector of the noise. And now if I hit this one, this is how it's mapped on. Let's just go to the colour of the noise. Right, so I think we need this to be smaller. So if we increase the scale, we're going to get more noise patterns. And we could increase detail and, 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 and faff around with this for ages, but that is going to look pretty decent straight away. And so it's kind of got a pretty decent look without doing much. So we have this and we have our base colour. And what I want is, you see these kind of highlights towards the edge of this mesh. Instead of those highlights just being this reflected light from the sky, I want it to be this thin film effect. So how do we do that? Well, we need to do a couple of things. I'm just going to select these and bring them down and bring that one up. So we need to mix these two shaders together. So let's go to um, shader, mix shader. And I'm going to put the thin film effect into shader two. And I'm going to put the base material into shader one. And then in, that's going to go into the surface. So at the moment, it's, it's equally mixing them um, between the base and the thin film by this factor. And the factor's in the middle at 0.5, which means it's equally mixing both. If I move that to zero, it's just the base. If I move it all the way to one, it's just the thin film. So let's put it back to the middle. So instead of using the slider, we are going to use an input into here to tell it only to apply it to the edges. So to do that, we're going to use an input and we're going to use a layer weight. And a layer weight gives you two options. You can either have a Fresnel. So obviously you probably know how a Fresnel works. It would be more reflective towards the edges of the, um, of the, of the curved object and less reflective um, facing you. Or we've got facing, which is slightly different. Now, this is going to give us a better effect. So, so what this is saying is, where it's black, it's a, when it's 100% black, it will be this shader, our base material. And where it is white, it will be the thin film. So let's just pop that into our factor. Now look at our mix shader. And there we've got it. We have got, let's just dolly in a bit. So the, the parts that are facing us directly are the base texture, and then the, it's falling off to this pretend thin film. But it, it's a little bit harsh. There's too much thin film. I want it closer to the edges. So let's just go back to this facing. So we need this to be more black and then fall off to white a bit more abruptly. So there's loads of different ways of doing that, but, but basically we, we need to add contrast to this black and white gradient. So... The way we'll do it is in our colour, we can adjust the colour of this with any of these, which you might be used to using in Photoshop or After Effects. So we could do it with an RGB curves. So let's put the curves in. I'm going to put that into the colour. Take the factor out. So we're feeding the black and white from this into the colour. And now with the colour, if I add a contrast curve, it will darken the black areas and we're getting more black now. So let's look at what that's done to the shader. And now that's pushed the thin film out just to those white bits. So that's using a, 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 a curve. Let's just delete that. Another way of doing it, doing the same thing, adding contrast to that black and white map. We could go to color. Let's, we could do it with a gamma adjustment. So let's put the color into the color and the color into the factor and increase the gamma and we're doing a similar thing we're kind of crushing it and then if we look at this shader we've pushed out the thin film to the very edges and that will do for our base so our base material is 
a, um, a, a black shiny reflective surface, a kind of fake thin film shiny reflective surface, which is only being applied to the very edges of the facing, which we've crushed with a gamma. And we're getting this very nice effect with not that many nodes. And it looks pretty cool. Very nice. Okay, so what we can do now is tidy up this node tree because this is just the start, this is the base. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to select all of those. I'm going to right click. I'm going to put um, group selected, which puts them into this group. And I'll just dolly in. And basically the group has all of, is, has all of the nodes inside and we've... Um, We've, we've, we've stacked them into this one group which makes it tidier but we just need to do one thing for it to work so if you notice our preview's gone black and that's because we need to put the mix shader into the output of the group and then I'll come out of it so now we have this output and we need to put that into our surface there we go so we're back to square one, but we have our base texture. And what I can do, if I uh, rename node, I can call this base mat. Excellent. And if I need to adjust any of those, I can go back in and make adjustments to all of these nodes. Uh, but at the moment, I can just leave it as is, and it's much cleaner. So let's put our first bit of detail on this texture now. So we're going to add a gold kind of leaf look to this, um, but just have it in very kind of defined places. And we're going to start mixing these together using the same principles that we've already employed. We're going to mix materials using a black and white map to di dictate how the mixing happens. So this is going to be our base and we're going to mix it with a gold colour. So let's get a shader and get a mix shader in there. And this will go into shader one. And this will be the new surface output for our material. So we need to get a gold material. So let's build one with a principled shader. And here we'll want a gold color. Put that into shader two. So we want a gold color and that'll do I'm not going to faff around with this uh, let's put the metallic up to full which will make it shiny and that'll do so right click hide on new sockets so now we're mixing a gold with our base layer this side's the base this side's the gold and in between is a horrible murky muddy mess so we're going to define where the gold is and where the base is by using a black and white map and we're going to get a really complex noise map um, to do this so let's right click go to texture and we'll go to noise texture and there is our noise texture in our viewport and we need to map this to the objects so let's go to input texture coordinates and we'll map the noise texture to the object coordinates okay so at the moment let's put the detail right up and and reduce that scale to let's try three so that reduces the scale actually makes it look bigger in the screen so that's good uh, it's not very detailed though it's very blobby this so if we try and use this to drive this um uh, to try and drive the mix of these two materials we're not going to get very far but here's a really good trick with these noise textures uh, you can uh, copy any node in cycles by holding control or command so you hold it down drag it and we get a new node and if I put the color of this one into the new vector and let's have a look at this new one it immediately adds detail let's do it again color into the vector more detail this is looking good so let's try could be enough let's just try one more color into the vector look at the new one all right so look at all that detail that we've got in there now it's kind of like a almost a marbly type texture looking really nice but again we, we need lots more contrast in this for it to work so we're going to do this contrast slightly differently this time. We're not going to just use a curves or a gamma adjustment. 
we're going to use a colour ramp, a grayscale colour ramp, which will give us the chance to clamp this in interesting ways. So let's right click, Converter, Colour Ramp, and we're going to put the factor into there. And let's have a look. So that's already darkened it slightly. And if I just clamp this ramp, look what happens. We get really interesting results. Okay, let's maybe bring that up a bit. A bit more. Right, so we're starting to get a lot of detail out of this noise texture, which has been mapped across this object, and it's, it's doing things that look quite good. So let's just try that. We'll put that into our mix shader, into the factor. And how does this mix our two materials together? Ah, well, it's kind of working, isn't it? We've got areas that are gold, the white bits, and we've got areas which are showing through the base texture. All right, but it's it's a bit muddy, and we don't want as much gold as this, so we kind of want to, we want to clamp this output further. So I'm just going to duplicate that, and let's feed that into our mix right so let's have a look at our new one so because we've kind of doubled this clamping process it's had much more of an impact on this one and now we can start seeing that we're getting really defined sharp detailed white highlights on this texture this looks fantastic so now when we look at the gold it's, it's much better this is going to look great now at the moment it looks fine. I like the shape, but it's, it's looking a bit boring. But later on, when we introduce some bump mapping to this, it's just going to immediately pop and look fantastic. But as it stands, I think that will do it. So you don't want too much gold leaf. We just want little bits here and there. And I think we're getting it quite nicely. Let's have a look. This side is a little bit bare of them, actually. So let's just try reducing the clamping of the second one a little to bring a bit more in. Yeah, so now we've got a bit more. And obviously, just play around with this until you get a look that you're happy with. But for me, that's going to work. That's fine for me. Very nice. So we have our gold mix, which is excellent. So what else do we need to do with this? Well, this is the kind of the, the base material now has, has, has pretty much finished. What else is there to do? Well, what we need to do, if you remember, is that we, we need to get the, the growth of the glowing elements of this um, of this material and the element the, 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 the glowing elements grow along with the growth of the coral itself so that's going to be the next section that we're going to work on so let's bring in an emission node so shader emission so this is for emitting light obviously um, so if we put that on we get this white uh, look so we're going to colour it first. We want this nice blue colour. So we could just go to the emission tab and uh, colour it blue and, and that would work. But what would be better, which will give us different tonal values depending on how bright it is, is if we use a black body, which has it's just one node and it has a temperature value. So let's put the temperature value down a little bit. I'm going to feed that into my colour. And now the emission node will be taking this colour. But what we can do is we can shift the hue. So let's go to colour, HSV, stick that in, and let's just shift this hue until we get the kind of bluish colour that we want. Something like, something like that, maybe. All right, so that's going to be our colour, and that'll that'll do us so now what we can do is we can use another map another black and white map to dictate the strength of this emission 
which will give us a really nice effect across our um, across our object. And what we're going to do, I'm actually going to, because we've got them, I'm going to reuse these nodes here. So I'm going to take... I'm going to steal and copy this ramp and I'm going to feed into it the colour from this noise that we've already used. So now I've got a new ramp. And what I'm going to do with that is I'm going to... I'm actually going to invert it to make it different. So let's right click and invert these knots. And now I've got a different, a very different map. Okay, good. And I'm going to make a copy of you. And let's put the colour into the factor. And let's just mess around with this until we've got something that looks half decent. So plenty of black bits, some harsh white bits. Let's just have a spin around. Okay, I think a bit more bright, brighter. Okay. So that's the basic light pattern. So then if we put this colour into the strength of our emission node, we get this, which is a nice effect. But what we can do is we can actually create a little power control by adding a math node. Uh, and this just gives a slider so we can increase or decrease the strength. So let's go to Converter Math. And we'll pop the math in. And we're going to change it from Add to Multiply. And now we have uh, a, a power slider in this math node. And at the moment, it's, it's timesing it by a, a value less than 1. So it's reducing its effect. So if we put up to 2... Let's just reset that. So now we've got this quite strong emission. That's looking pretty good. And the beauty of this is we've managed to just borrow some of the nodes that we've already used. Excellent. So now where are we? Let's just remind, remind ourselves what we've got. We've got our mix texture here, which is our gold flake on top of our base object. And now we have this new emission. So we want to mix these two together. So I'm going to make a copy of this one. And let's put the emission, the blue light, into the other one. And now we have a mix of these two. Okay, which isn't what we want. What we want to do is we want the light to grow on as the coral grows on and then gently fade off. So how are we going to do that? Well, if you remember when we built this scene, let me just jump into my regular view. If you remember when we built this scene, um, we coloured the particles that were driving the open VDB mesher. So let me just make that invisible. So here are the particles, and we coloured them from black, from white, and then fade into black as they got older. So what we want to do is we want to get the white values from these particles and feed them somehow into a map in cycles, which will give us that black and white map. So when it is white now, we'll see that nice blue emissive material. And as they go black, that'll fade away. So how do we do that? Let's go back to our cycles view. All right. So what we need to do, we're going to feed this new map based on those particle colours into the factor of this mix shader. So we need a couple of things. We need a node that's going to allow us to access that particle colour information. And we, that node is in the textures and it is a point density texture. And what this is going to do, we are going to be able to kind of create a volume radius around each particle inheriting the color of that particle and um, it will create this 
black and white volume which will animate over time. So what we need to do with this point density texture, we need to tell it which object you're getting your information from. Uh, we've got this object box here and it, it's the emitter. So let's drag in this emitter and we need to tell it which particle, which bit of data do you want to get from that object. So we want to get the particle colour which is what we set. And if I hit colour, at the moment this node isn't doing anything. What we need to do is a, a couple of things. Take off normalise and I'll do it here so it's more obvious. So we've taken off this normalise and we need to map it to world space and we need the interpolation to be cubic. Okay. And let's just move this on a little bit. And we can see it's starting to happen, but the radius is way too big. So the white particles are just blocking out all of the black ones because the radius around them is huge. So if I decrease the radius, you'll see that we're starting to reveal the true colours. And then what we want to do is reduce the voxel size, which will help with the detail and make it kind of higher res. So I would say probably a voxel size, let's get it way down at 1, and a radius of 4. Right, so now what we have got, we've got a shader which as we play it, it's growing on with the same, obviously following the shape of the coral, and as they're getting older, they're fading to black, which is definitely what we want. So, so, so we're getting there. This is looking good. So what we need to do is treat this a little bit because it's not quite right just yet. So let's take that colour and let's put it into a colour ramp so we can kind of make adjustments. So we'll pop it in. Uh, so now we're in the colour ramp. We can do some clamping. So in fact, we've got such a bright value here. What we could do, we could do with reducing this. So a quick way of reducing it without before we put it into the ramp is we can just we can multiply it by an amount less than one and it will it will reduce it. So let's just try that converter math pop it in. Let's change it to multiply. And now we're multiplying it by a value of less than one. OK, and then in our color ramp. Let's bring this down. Okay, and we'll change this, we'll just, we might, we're going to adjust this, let's just bring this white value down a little bit. Okay, so now we have this animating three-dimensional uh, black and white map, which we can use to drive the mixing of these two materials. So let's see what happens, we'll take the colour of that, put it into the factor, and there we go. So what we have now is, if we just dolly in a bit, we've got our original base material. We have the gold flex. And then animating on, we have this emissive material. So let's just try, I'll just switch off the subdivision surface, which will make us process a bit more quickly. And let's just chug, this will chug a bit, but let's just see. So now we've got this, we've got this glowing texture which grows on as the coral develops, but then disappears. Leaving behind it, the base material. Okay. So that's working. Good. So let's take that off. So now we need to start making a few adjustments. And we need to get some bump going on here. Um, so we just dolly in again. Um, this is looking very nice. Um, but it's all kind of flat, shiny surfaces. Um, and 
a bit of bump detailing is is really going to make the difference here and make this look fantastic so how we do the bump is if I just zoom in on my node editor. So at the moment, our shader, which we've set up, is um, going into the surface of the output node. And we've got this displacement node uh, here, displacement port. So what we need to do is input a black and white texture into this displacement, and it's going to create the displacement for us. Um, so let's just go into the material settings and we've got a material settings part and here there is a displacement method pull down and we can have bump true or both now true means displacement rather than just bump mapping where actually the, the, the polygons are being displaced and moved whereas bump is just the illusion of displacement um, now true displacement only works if in your render settings, I've got my render settings docked up here. If in your render settings you have, in your Cycles 4D settings, you need to have... Um, let's move up. You need to have Features Experimental selected. Otherwise, that displacement won't work. Um, it'll just it'll just uh, resort back to doing just normal bump mapping but for us that is what we are going to be doing we're going to be do doing bump mapping so we'll just keep it on bump so what we need is a black and white map now we could make a new one out of the noises in a similar way in which we made the previous but we've already made one so we could probably reuse one of these maps that we've already made so I'm just gonna have a look at some of the outputs of some of these noises now black is going to be no bump applied and white is going to be a hundred percent bump and then gray anywhere in between so what we want is we want a fair bit of white, but we want lots of variation between whites and greys. And it's it's nice to have quite a few patches of black of areas where there isn't any bump going on at all. And it'll really make the, the, the bump pop then. So this, I think there's too much black in this one, um, which means there's going to be too many areas where there isn't enough bump going on. So let's go in the one before it. So now this one looks a bit more promising. Um... So let's just let's just put that one in and see what kind of bump this map gives us. So all I need to do is take this output and put it into the displacement. Let's deselect that. And let's have a look at what this bump is going to do. Now it's probably going to be a bit harsh. Um, I'll just get a bit closer. So it's gone very dark and we've lost all of the reflections. And that's because there's so much bump on this um, material now. So what we need to do is reduce is reduce the strength of that bump. But we can see we've got some nice reflective elements here now. Um, you see this this hole here where there isn't any bump and it's got the shiny reflective surface and then the other parts that don't and you can see it in this this part as well. So we want to, we want to reduce the effects of this bump a little. So we haven't got a slider, there isn't a bump um, severity amount or anything like that so all we need to do is put in a multiply math node and that'll give us the strength slider so let's go to converter math let's zoom in a little bit um, and let's change that to multiply and we want to stick it in there and now we're able to reduce the amount of that bump by just reducing this second value um, so let's try 0.1 all right, so straight away that that looks quite nice, doesn't it? Um, let's just dolly out a bit. Uh, let's change that value again. Uh, point one. So that's looking better. We've got areas of bump now, and if we go to the gold sections, you'll be able to see that we're getting so much nice detail in this bump. It looks really really cool and then we've got these areas where there isn't any bump happening and that is the uh the black areas have got no bump so that's looking really good and that just it, it's amazing the, the difference that that bump uh makes to the overall look okay good
So at the moment, this scene is only being lit by our environment object, which is being hidden from the camera at the moment, but that's our environment object. And that's our only light source. Um, and what that's doing is it's giving us this nice edge lightness around here, which looks, which looks good. But we could do with, with bringing some lights in, some additional lights in to help light the front parts of this object. So what we can do, what I'll do is I'll, um, let's jump back into the uh, regular layout while we position our lights and then I can go back into um, to the cycles one when we start looking at the render and how it's looking. So here we are back in our scene and let's just dolly out. So let's make my mesh visible and I'll just scrub through to about here. Right, so this is our scene and our camera is at this angle and we need some lighting perhaps it from this direction and also perhaps from behind to help kind of illuminate the edges somewhat. So let's do that. So we'll go to the cycles menu and we'll go to a cycles light and this light, let's make it an area light and we'll rotate it. And this one's going to be a kind of a, a light to the rear. There we go. All right, that looks good. So let's just see what, if any, difference that is going to make to our render. So we'll jump back to our cycles view. And now we have got this light. Let's look through the camera that we'll be using. And let's increase the intensity of this light. So it's giving us these highlights around here. Let's just come out of that camera again. And let's get closer to it. So it's giving us more kind of highlights around this section. I've turned the light off, there off, turn it back on. So that's looking quite good. I like that. Um, just going to give it the slightest touch of a blue hue. Let's go a bit darker blue. Okay, so that's looking nice, very good. And I think we could perhaps have a light coming down from above. So I'll just jump back to my layout. So what I can do is hold control, grab this, and then rotate R for the rotate tool, point it downwards, and kind of like, Lighting from above will look quite dramatic. All right. This one, I don't want that colour. I'm going to just give it, try it with a warmer colour and just see. Right, so let's go back to our Cycles 4D view. Let's dolly right in and see what this light gives us. So this light is is bringing some really nice reflections onto the onto the gold, and that's shadowing it a little bit more and and just giving us way more detail. So we go back to my camera view, and now this is starting to look like the effect that we're after. This is this is looking decent. Okay. So what happens is our growth comes on with our glowing coral, the glowing subsides to leave behind the gold leaf. And this would be one render where we're kind of far out following the glow growth. And then I guess a different render, a different shot would be much more of a close up as it's as it's growing and seeing the gold leaf develop. So that's looking I'm very pleased with that. I think we can leave that alone for the time being. Let's come away from that one. And I'm going to call that 
coral material finished. We might do some tweaking a bit later, but that is going to be called finished. So the final thing we need to set up before we can really start thinking about the final render uh, is we need to get these uh, particles rendered and included into the scene, and then we need to set up some uh, shallow depth of field um, to get those working for us and see what that final look is going to be. So that's the next thing to build is the particles. So to get good feedback, let's switch off our cell auto system because we don't need to see that. We're just going to be looking at our particles and we'll come out of our camera. All right. So at the moment, obviously, we're not rendering these particles. We can't see them in our um, real time preview. So we need to give them a material first to be able to do that. So let's go to create cycles 4d and we're going to make an emission material because we want these particles to emit light so let's click on that and we have our new node structure so if i put this material emission material on our floaties emitter now we have particles not what we want yet but they are rendering and there we go they're coming into the viewport there we go. So we have a start. So by default, Cycles 4D creates sphere instances for every particle. And without the correct tag, we've got no control over what these are like. But if we put an X particles instance tag on this emitter, we can then control exactly what it is instancing and, and how that's set up. So let's do that. So we'll highlight the emitter and we'll go to tags, cycles 4D tags, instance tag. So now by default, it's spheres. The spheres have 24 segments, which if you start to have a lot of particles in your scene, it's having to create a lot of geometry in these instances um, which isn't great also we've got a size multiplier so we can reduce the size of those particles and then we can give them a random size as well which is nice but here's the powerful thing we can also put objects in here and we can instance objects so what I'm going to do is I'm going to instance cubes instead of spheres because they're much lower geometry, so they'll run quicker and render quicker. And these are going to be so small and they're going to be blurred out with the depth of field that they're not going to look like cubes anyway. So let's just bring in the Cinema 4D cube. Let's put the emission material on the cube. And then we'll drag the cube into the objects and now it's all gone white because it's making these huge cubes because they're 200 meters across so let's just put this down to i don't know five centimeters okay good and now we can reduce the size multiplier down to tiny little spheres uh, cubes and then we'll get a bit of a random size so now it should run more efficiently because the instances aren't as kind of polygon intensive. So there's our floaties. Very nice. So we need uh, to get some decent colour. So we're going to do the same colour trick as we did with the glowing elements of our coral. We're going to use a black body and then kind of shift the hue. So let's go to a converter, black body. And we put that into the colour channel. So now we've got these orange ones reduce the temp so now we want to do a, a kind of a hue shift so we'll go to color hsv and we'll just shift the hue it was about around here wasn't it that we got our kind of blue maybe drop the saturation a tad okay so that's going to be the color but now we, we want these to have a varied emission strength we don't want them all to be emitting um, the same intensity and that's why we gave the particles these colours, these random colours from black to white. We're going to use that to drive how strong they're emitting this light. So what we need to do is get, feed that particle information into cycles. So we need a spe we've got a special node for that. Let's go to right click and it is a input particle info node. And we can get or farm all of this data that is contained within the particles and use it in cycles. We only need the colour because we coloured them black to white. So let's take this colour 
Well, let's just pipe it directly into the strength and see what happens. So there we go. So the white particles are giving off a certain amount of intensity and the black particles are giving off much less and then they're kind of ramping in between. So already we've got nice variation. Looks better. But we haven't got any control over this strength. So what we want to do is do the same old trick as putting in a math multiply node, which will then give us a strength slider. So let's right click, converter, math. We'll change this to multiply, pop it in. And now we have this slider which can control the intensity. We can put it up, make them brighter. There we go. So that's much better. And now we've got these floaties that are organically moving and looking nice. Good. So depending on your scene, depending on your camera and its setup and the, the, the level of, of de uh, depth of field blur, you may want to put spheres in and not have this very kind of cubic look. But if you can get away with cubes, it's much better because it's, it's much lighter to, um, to process. So let's go back into our um, camera. So we'll go back into our camera from which we'll be rendering. Let's switch back on the, um, the coral system. And we'll get a better idea of how these look. So there they're going, they're floating around. And as we're moving up, they're kind of doing their thing. We're looking very nice. All right. So let's just add some depth of field now. So at the moment, this camera doesn't have any cycles controls. Um, and to access the cycle settings like depth of field and motion blur and, and, and the other things that you're able to do, we need to give it a cycles 4D tag. So we'll go to tags, cycles 4D tags and a camera tag. And this camera tag then unlocks these Cycles 4D settings with um, depth of field, motion blur parameters, and also some post effects like vignetting and, and bloom and glare. So the way it works is this. If I increase in the depth of field bit the size of the radius, we we'll get blur and everything's being blurred out now. And if I increase the blades, these are the blades of the shutter. And this will give you these really nice kind of bokeh effects. If we give it, a, say, six. So now we have got nice hexagonal um, bokeh particles, which look fantastic. But the problem here is our coral is completely out of focus. We're not focusing on the correct area. So to do that, you go into the camera settings, the regular Cinema 4D camera settings, and in the object tag, you have your focal distance. So this is the area that's in focus. And if I click this, ar this arrow, I can click on any part of my scene and the camera will focus in on that section. So let's click on the mesh here. And now the mesh is in focus and we've got some of the closer and further away particles um, out of focus and the ones close to the mesh obviously are more in focus. So this is looking, this is looking good. There's one coming right across the front of the camera. And that's looking nice. Now I think these are a little bit too big now that we've kind of blurred them out. So let's go back to our particle instance tag and reduce this size multiplier down to maybe five and the size variation to about 15. Okay, I think that's looking better. Uh, and I'm just going to jump back into my regular layout so I can get a better view of our mesh and I'm going to focus in on say this section here okay let's jump back to cycles okay so now we have got these nice particles doing their thing as we go up and that will do for now so obviously you can make adjustments to this you can adjust the brightness in this section here you can bring them down a bit if you think they're too bright uh, you could adjust the colour, um, you could be uh, 
just do a little bit more work. But for, for us, for this scene, these are going to work fine for us. So that's looking pretty good. So the last stage now is to set up the settings for the final render to uh, put this out. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to change my layout again to a slightly different one, which is going to give us a bigger area in which to play around in so we can have a really good look at this real-time preview um, to make sure we're getting the right render settings. So I'm going to stick this up to 100. So I've got this set to 50 samples in my real-time preview and what we're looking for is finding out how many samples we need to set it to so that probably the most blurry areas aren't particularly noisy. These blurred out particles are where you're going to see um, the noise the worst. So if we know that these sections are okay, then we know that the final render and everywhere else is going to be all right as well. Now, we've got this set to 50 samples and it's it's chugging through and it's got an awful long way to go and already it's not even halfway there yet and I can see that this is, is pretty clean and a little bit of noise in these blurred out areas is actually quite good. It makes it look like a realistic kind of film look. So 50 samples is far too much for what we need, I think. We can get away with having um, fewer. So let's just put this down to, say, 25, which is half that amount. So this will take more than... Uh, it'll be more than twice as quick because the samples are kind of exponential. Um, they're, they're, they are the sample amount times by, I think it's times by four even. So 25 samples is hugely quicker than 50, more than twice as quick. So there we go. And we can see there's a, a little bit of noise in this blurred out area. I'm not sure if you can see it on this screencast, but there's not so much that it looks awful. So 25 samples is a good amount, I think. And there's a chance, you know, we could we could even go with less than that and have a quicker render. But um, this is going to be the final render, so let's not skimp on it. We'll go with 25. Good. So the only other thing that we want to um, sort out with this in the render is... Um, Let's go into our render settings here and set up cycles as being our renderer. So in your renderer, you want to pick cycles to be the render, render you're going to use. Um, and let's change in our output. Let's make this full 1080p. And we're going to render frames 10 to 300. Good. And then save, we have got open EXR as our format. That is a 32-bit file format. So we're going to have all of this 32-bit light and color information that our real-time preview is um, displaying is going to be matched in our render settings. So that's going to be good. No surprises there. Then in our cycles options, let's just make this a little bit bigger. We need to set this up. So the device, I want to use my CUDA um, cards. I've got two 1080 Ti's, so that's going to be relatively quick for me. So set that to CUDA. I can leave my tiles as default. I can leave that as default, threads as default. In my integer sampling, this is where I need to match my samples. So I decided that 25 was okay in my real-time preview. So if I stick 25 here, I'm going to get the same look. And we're not going to be using the denoising feature in this render. And so if you're not using denoising, always remember to have a seed value here of zero. And this means that um, your noise from frame to frame, any noise that is created in the render, will be animated noise, which is what you get when you record properly with film. The noise is never static, it's always fuzzy and animating. And having a seed of zero means that um, there isn't a fixed noise for each frame, it'll change on a per frame basis, meaning it'll look more realistic any noise that's there. So if you're not using denoising, make sure you've got the seed to zero. So that's it for that. Let's get down to our light paths and ray depth. I'll just switch all these down so they're outside. Okay, so light paths and ray depth. So at the moment, we've got a glossy depth of two. So glossy is our reflections, and we've got lots of reflections in this scene, so we're going to need that. We've got diffuse as well. So I'm going to say that we need at least uh, we need at least two. So let's go with... We won't get a glossy depth of two or a diffuse depth of two unless our max ray bounces is at least two. Otherwise, it, it can't get to this amount. So let's just... We're going to put this at four, just to be safe. Um, and I think that's going to do us for that. 
So the only other thing we want to activate is we want to render some motion blur. And the reason we want motion blur is some of our floaties are actually moving relatively quickly. And we want to give that, um, they will, it'll look a bit odd if they are particularly crisp and moving quickly. Because obviously, if they were shot with a real camera and it was kind of dust particles or whatever, they would have motion blur to them. So we need to add that. But the thing to note with Cycles 4D motion blur is that it doesn't work on objects that have differing numbers of vertices. And that's because it's the way in which it works out. Um, the motion blur on the frame previous and the frame after is to do with the points of an object. Now, our um, open VDB mesher is a dynamic mesh. It's growing on and it's creating new polygons as and when it needs it. That means that it has changing number of vertices, which means it won't work properly when we render with motion blur. So what we need to do is tell cycles that we want to render with motion blur, but we want to ignore the open VDB mesher. So the way in which we do that is pretty simple. So we'll activate motion blur, but we're going to deselect affect all objects. So let's untick that. So now it is only going to apply motion blur to objects in which we tell it to. So what we need to do is apply motion blur to just the particles. So the particles are instancing this cube object. This is what the particles are. And the cube object is this one in our scene file, in our object manager. So we need to tell this object to apply motion blur. And it's really easy to do. We just go to tags, cycles 4D tags, object tag. And in the object tag, We've got all these um, options. These are kind of like the external compositing options. Leave that default. But there's a motion blur tab and we just need to activate it. So now we have said apply motion blur to this cube, which is being instanced by all of the particles. So now if I go to my real time preview and hit render and activate the view. So it's rendering. And is there any motion blur? Well, we need to check one more setting. The real-time preview needs to be set to render motion blur. So let's go to the render settings. And we haven't got it ticked, so it's not rendering motion blur, which is why we can't see it. So let's check that. And now it's going to recalculate. And this is going to take a lot longer to render because motion blur is expensive because it's effectively having to analyze three frames instead of just one. It needs the frame you're rendering and the one before and the one after to work out where the motion blur movement is coming from. Okay, so we've got a little bit of motion blur there, but perhaps not quite enough. So let's go to our camera settings, which is where we can set up the motion blur. So here's my camera tag. Here's the depth of field that we've already set. And here's the motion blur options. And the amount of blur will be dictated by the shutter time. This is the shutter speed in a camera. So the longer the shutter takes to close, the more light is coming in, which means you're going to get more blur. The smaller the shutter time duration, the, the less blur there will be. So if we up this to, let's just put this to 0 0.07. So it's more than doubled it. And it'll just work that out. It'll take a while as it chugs through. And now you can see we're starting to get this blurred view here. So I'm just going to minimize this somewhat. Let's put it down to 50% the size of this so we can get an idea of the whole uh, frame. So now we're getting these particles blurring in the direction of their travel. And that's looking an awful lot better. And I think actually that amount of 0 0.07 is looking good. We don't want it too much, but when they're moving quickly, we want more blur. And when they're moving not as quickly, we want less blur like these ones. Excellent. So that's looking good. So I'm happy with that. We've got our samples right. We've got our motion blur on, which is just affecting our particles. So we're ready to do this render. So let's go to my uh, render settings and double check everything. So we're doing 1080p. We're rendering a manual range from 10 to 300 frames. We've got our file path selected. We're rendering open EXRs. And in cycles, I've got my um, CUDA selected. 25 samples, motion blur selected, so we're ready to go. So I'll start this rendering and I'll pause the tutorial and once it's finished I'll come back to you, show you the render and tell you how long it took.
And here's the final render. So this took about two and a half hours to complete in total for around 300 frames, which isn't too bad. And it's looking pretty nice. Um, these floaties are giving a, a great bit of movement to the scene. Uh, they're working well. I think the amount of blur and the motion blur is working pretty well for those. I think the camera move works nicely. We've got this uh, initial development with some uh, blurred out portions in the foreground. We've got this nice um, camera rotation as well as uh, moving upwards. And I think it's nice. The glow looks good and it leaves behind the growth of the gold leaf, which itself gets some really nice kind of um, glinting highlights. And it works well with the roughness of that texture as well. So all in all, I'm pretty pleased with that. And this is um, a pretty decent representation of the technique that Mario used in his um, X Particles reel. So that is it. That is rendering our XP cell auto procedural growth animation using Cycles 4D. Don't forget, if you'd like some more content on X Particles 4 and Cycles 4D, then please go to the Insidium YouTube channel. Here, hit subscribe, and this will mean that you'll get all of the latest material as soon as it's released. So, until next time, I'll see you later.